Welcome to the Stanford Women's Health Podcast Series. I'm Dr. Sharon Hung, Director of Women's Health for the Primary Care and Population Health Department at Stanford. From debunking myths to exploring the latest research, we will delve into the world of women's health with leading experts in the field. Dr. Brenda Bavon is a board-certified obstetrics gynecologist at Stanford HealthCare. She completed both her residency in OBGYN and her fellowship in reproductive endocrinology and infertility at Stanford University. Her area of expertise is in reproductive medicine and fertility treatment and preservation, and she's had numerous publications and presentations on these topics. I'm so honored to be able to speak with her today as she has personally helped a number of my patients who are struggling with infertility. Dr. Bavon, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. I wanted to start by asking, how did you get into this field? Oh, that's a great question. I was so fortunate to, as an undergrad at Stanford, be connected with Dr. Valerie Baker, who was an REI and reproductive endocrinology and fertility specialist for a research project I was interested in. And I learned about this amazing field that united both uh, very compassionate patient care, fascinating um, technology and ethics and um, really strong basic science. And um, I was hooked. <laughs> and so I went through the rest of my medical training really wanting to be an REI. Great. Thank you for sharing that. And I've been really looking forward to this conversation with you because I feel like I had really no training on infertility management during my internal medicine residency. And yet so many of my patients are struggling with infertility. So I wanted to just start with some background information. What is the definition of infertility? How common is it? How does the prevalence increase as women age? Those are amazing questions. And everything you echoed is a sentiment we're hearing from a lot of primary care providers, general ob that there is a lot of patient interest in learning about their fertility or struggles with building the family that they want. <clears throat> so for the definition of infertility, we'll start there. So traditionally, it had been regarding heterosexual couples. If I have a female patient that is less than 35, someone who's been trying with regular unprotected intercourse for greater than 12 months, and they have not had a successful pregnancy. And if that couple is with a female partner greater than 35 or equal to 35, six months or more of trying and not having a successful pregnancy. What was really great is in 2023, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine put out um, an official, um, more inclusive definition of infertility. So it also is for anybody that needs donor gametes. So that could be individuals who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. So same-sex male, same-sex female couples needing donor eggs or donor sperm, for instance, or single persons who want to build their family on their own and access donor gametes. Um, and then always it's been medical issues that might necessitate need for help off the bat. So you don't have to wait 12 months if you are not having very regular periods and don't know when you're ovulating, or if you have problems with vaginismus and really painful intercourse and can't have pelvic exams or um, able to have sex <clears throat> without pain, then we want to be able to help you sooner. Same thing with male sexual dysfunction and erectile dysfunction, for instance. Um, so, you know, the hope with being more inclusive was that we can have more people have access to our field. Great. And, um, I'm curious, how has the landscape of fertility treatments changed as, as women or families are delaying family building for educational career goals or just other personal reasons? Yeah, that has been a really big shift, um, just socio-epidemiologically speaking, um, is that we are seeing uh, the age of first birth or times that people are first trying to conceive is becoming later in life. And actually, <clears throat> where we are in the Bay Area has one of the oldest um, age of first birth <clears throat> for our area. And I think it tends to trend with our um, focus on a lot of the things you highlighted, which is finishing our educational girls, focusing on career stability, um, partnership stability, financial stability, um, and uh, feeling that that is pushing us further into what has been um, deemed this reproductive window, or um, I don't love the term, but it's out there, biological clock that people feel pressure. Um, so we know, um, <clears throat> to share a little bit of physiology is my like fun fact I ask people at 
um, their new patient visits or like nerdy cocktail party fun fact to share is like, when did we have the most eggs we ever had in our lives as 46 XX individuals? And that's actually when um, we were a 16 to 20 week fetus in our biological mother. And so um, that time we have about six to 7 million eggs and that's what we get. And it's genetically programmed in us to have a decline through the lifetime. So by the time we're born, we're at about one to 2 million. By the time we go through puberty, we're at about half to 1 million. And by the time we go through menopause, we're at less than a thousand and they're thought to be less good quality and we stop cycling. <clears throat> Average age of menopause in North America is around 51. And so um, we notice that this decline is happening through the lifetime, but in our early thirties, there's a slight increase in the rate of decline. And then in our later 30s, definitely early 40s, there's a more marked decrease. So we find that if more people are starting their family later in this window of time, that they're going to be facing a higher rate of infertility and possibly miscarriage because we know that the egg counts are coming down and the quality is coming down. And so that translates to the reproductive outcomes that we're seeing. I see. And um, you mentioned earlier the changes in definitions, and I do want to recognize there's so many different ways to build a family. And for the purpose of most of my questions, they'll be on people who are born in ovaries and trying to get pregnant. And so as women are starting to try to get pregnant, sometimes I recommend using things like a free fertility app to track their uh, fertility window. Are there any other tools you recommend so that patients can increase their chances of catching that fertility window when they start trying? Okay, that is a great question. And what you are sharing with your patients is a great starting place. So for optimizing chances for natural fertility, cycle awareness is excellent. So you can start with some of our free apps out there um, that are helping people understand when their ovulatory window is and when they can start timing intercourse during that. Um, some people can really just use a calendar, have an idea how long are my cycles apart from one another. So cycle day one is first day of full flow bleeding. And so when is one cycle day one to the next cycle day one? Very classically, we say that's 28 days, but we know normal can be between 25 to 35 days apart. And so we know that if you take the interval of your cycles and subtract 14 days, that's about when ovulation should be happening. So if you have a classic 28 day cycle, subtract 14, you're probably ovulating around day 14. And so we're not robots and there might be variation every month as to when exactly it's happening. And so some people will kind of time intercourse to be day 10, 12, and 14 to cover some time. We know that sperm will last in the reproductive tract for about three to five days. So we, some people will try to time it earlier um, or around ovulation. Um, we know that in our data, probably the highest chance of conceiving um, in a month is the uh, day before you're ovulating. <clears throat> so the sperm is there and ready and waiting. Um, and so, yes, so calendar-based approach, using an app to do that math for you and help you out is good. And we'll take your history of prior months and aggregate that data and give advice. Um, and there's also ovulation predictor kits. And those are um, really like a urine test st um, stick that you can use to dip urine. Everyone is a little bit different. Often they're the first void in the morning. You can check for um, the urine levels of um, luteinizing hormone or LH. And we know you'll get a peak about 24 hours before you'll ovulate. And so patients, when they get that peak, will know, okay, I'll have intercourse that day um, so that we're hopefully optimizing um, the timing to have intercourse that day or the and the day following. Uh, there are some that have one we recommend is the clear blue one that has a smiley face system. So the smiley face kind of user-friendly is either empty, you're not really close, or it's starting to blink, you're getting close. We notice the LH is rising, or um, we see that they'll say there's the peak day where the solid smiley face is noted. And that's the day you definitely want to try for intercourse if able. Uh, but, you know, for for couples starting out, I recognize it's an exciting time. It's a nerve wracking time. It's a lot of data information. And I usually tell my patients to um, enjoy the process. And sometimes some people like being very data based and getting all the collection from the calendar, the app, the OPKs and other people just want to try to have unprotected intercourse for a few months. Um, so it really, you know, depends on the couple and how proactive they want to be, how many of these things they have to start with from the get-go. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. And certainly being in the Bay Area, I think the majority of my patients are very data-driven. Um, and I'm curious about the um, test strips that you mentioned. 
I've heard that, you know, particularly in patients with, let's say, PCOS, there might be false positives because their LH can be higher. Do you mind commenting on that? And maybe if there's any other limitations to the ovulation test strips? Yes, that's an excellent point. So they are really good tools, but they can be imperfect. And so for individuals with PCOS, we know that they can have just a higher basal rate of LH and um, false positives are higher in the PCOS population. And so I'll have my patients try them out. And if they end up getting a false positive, you know, for our fertility treatments, we are doing um, ultrasound monitoring often or blood work backup often. So we can try to validate and say, oh, that was a false positive. Maybe these don't work as well for you. We'll pivot to other ways to help guide um, your ovulation status. Um, and oftentimes patients can work with us and we have different ways to help them, but they can lead to false positives for PCOS patients and they shouldn't be deterred that something's wrong with them. It's very normal for PCOS patients that they might have to come to see us to actually get a blood test or ultrasound follow-up to understand. Okay, great. That's good to keep in mind. Um, and then as people are trying to get pregnant, are there any lifestyle changes or dietary modifications that have been shown to specifically maximize the likelihood of pregnancy? Yeah, I think that's a great question. There's a lot out there. Um, and unfortunately, there is some that's evidence-based and some that's not. And I really try to take up an approach of moderation with my patients. So, you know, with regard to lifestyle, we really want to have our optimal health going into pregnancy to uh, have good, you know, perinatal and postpartum outcomes. Um, and I find it's when patients are really motivated to make those changes to um, help, you know, themselves and their future families for a healthy start. So I think there are things such as um, meeting our goals for uh, diet and exercise. So for diet, I always say a balanced diet, we want to have, um, you know, a good amount of leafy greens and high proteins and less amount of simple carbohydrates or um, simple sugars that um, unfortunately are the yummy things, but <laughs> keeping that more of a treat than a daily, you know, habit. And for exercise, really, you know, our primary care goal is about 30 minutes of moderate exercise five times a week or 25 minute, minutes of vigorous exercise three times a week. Uh, and, you know, maintaining that if at a healthy weight or maybe making weight loss goals if in the overweight or obese categories. Um, obviously, we recommend stopping things like any tobacco use. There is some data that chronic marijuana use can lead to um, uh, decreased egg and sperm quality. And so we encourage patients to stop. And um, with regard to alcohol, there's really no safe amount of alcohol that is out there per the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology for patients while they're trying, just in case they could get pregnant and be early pregnant and drinking. So we often will help advise people to stop as they're trying to conceive. Um, and for male partners, you know, we say you can stop in solidarity as well, or definitely keep it to less than seven drinks a week. Yeah. And then what about the role of supplements? I've had a number of my patients come back from REI clinic with a prescription for vitamin D, CoQ, and others. I'm just curious how strong the evidence is behind supplements helping with fertility. Yes. Um, the supplement industry has boomed and we really, at least at Stanford, try to stay more evidence-based and um, the main ones that we recommend, it's really important to be on a prenatal vitamin with an adequate amount of folic acid. So we want at least 400 micrograms daily, and usually your prenatal vitamins will have six to 800. Um, so you will be well covered there. Uh, we also have, you know, shown we're very blessed in the Bay Area to have sunshine, but a lot of us are still working a lot indoors and not getting that sun exposure that we need to keep healthy vitamin D levels. And so we will have our patients supplement vitamin D3, 2000 international units on top of the, the approximate 1000 that's in a prenatal vitamin. Um, and then there is some data to support the use of coenzyme Q10, which is thought to be almost like an antioxidant against oxidative stress that um, we can see might impact egg quality in some studies for sperm quality. And so my patients, um, I typically would recommend that for patients over the age of 35, but my patients who are younger than that and want to try it can. 
Um, there's so much out there about additional supplements like DHEA, um, 25 milligrams, three times a day. Um, there's some data to show it could be helpful. Um, we get worried if people over supplement though. So I think at the bare minimum a prenatal, if people also want to add the vitamin D, um, that's good. And then really it's for my infertile patients or patients maybe dealing with recurrent pregnancy loss that I'll talk about these additional supplements like coenzyme Q10 and DHEA, but that's a conversation we had with your, you know, physician team. Okay, great. Good to know that I'm learn using coenzyme Q10 is, is, is a new fact for me. Um, and then let's jump into kind of the lab evaluation we do for infertility. But before we do so, can you kind of review the ba major buckets of causes of infertility? Yes, that's great. Um, so for infertility, about a third of couples will come back unexplained, which is, I understand a double-edged sword because some people want to be like, well, here's the problem and we'll fix it and things will be better. But other people don't want to necessarily have a problem, but these patients still warrant help with treatments such as intrauterine insemination or IVF. Um, but yeah, really to understand what could be the problem, we have to understand what's normally needed and that guides our testing and that guides our diagnosis. And so if we're dealing with a heterosexual couple for a 46XX individual, that would be the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, and the uterine cavity, then also just pre-pregnancy health, right? We want to have any medical issues well optimized. So screening for things like anemia or diabetes, high blood pressure, making sure those are all well under control. Um, and then on the 46XY side, it would be sperm or any sexual dysfunction issues on, on either the um, female or male parts. Um, so with regard to causes that kind of guides us into the causes. So all the testing could come back normal, which would be unexplained, which is about a third of couples, um, age related tends to impact the ovaries. And so we find people who have lower counts or quality concerns can be meeting what we call diminished ovarian reserve. Um, people can have, um, ovulatory issues. So they could have PCOS and not be regularly ovulating and getting a chance to get pregnant. Um, or people that don't necessarily, we can talk more about PCOS later too, but, um, meet PCOS criteria, but just don't have regular ovulation and need help to understand how to time intercourse. Um, so that's really in the ovary category. Um, for the tubes, so individuals that have tubal disease could be someone with a history of blocked tubes because of surgical adhesions, um, untreated sexually transmitted infections that could have scarred the tubes or history of recurrent ectopic pregnancies that could have damaged the tube. So maybe the egg and sperm can't meet because there's some pathology there within the tubes. Then for the uterine cavity, really it has to be within the endometrial cavity where the embryo would implant and the fetus would grow. So things there that could cause infertility are fibroids um, and polyps that are large, um, scar tissue history if someone's had surgeries within the uterus and it's scarred down and not having normal cycling with healthy tissue. Um, those, are, those are concerns as well. Um, there's endometriosis. So that's... Um, meant to be um, endometrial glands and stroma that are found outside of the uterus within the pelvic or peritoneal cavity um, and adenomyosis. So that actually is found within the uterine uh, muscle and not within the endometrial cavity. And that can lead to pain, that can lead to um, issues with intercourse, that can um, lead to scarring or an inflammatory process within the um, uterine cavity. So there's a lot of reasons that's been linked to infertility as well. Uh, so those are um, some of the causes and then, and then male factor, as I mentioned. So low sperm counts or poorly moving sperm or poor morphology of the sperm or issues with sexual function, such as on the female side, vaginismus or male side, um, that we're talking about erectile dysfunction or issues with um, ejaculatory function. Yeah, a, a long answer to your, to your question, but yeah. those are the main buckets I think of are kind of ovarian, tubal, uterine, male factor, and then there's a few under each one. Okay, great. No, that's a great framework to start to think about the causes of infertility. And I'll just expand on a few of those that we might commonly see in primary care. So mm -hmm. for example, for PCOS, you know, should we be sending patients with PCOS sooner to see a fertility specialist or does it depend on their menstrual history? What do you recommend? Yeah, I think taking a, a thorough history is great. So for PCOS, I would want to know, you know, how far apart are the periods? So I have some patients where they're 45 days apart, but they're pretty regular 
they're able to have an idea when they're ovulating and those individuals might want to be more, um, you know, on wanting to try for unassisted conception and try in their own. Um, so that's not unreasonable to give them time and when they're ready and wanting, they can follow up if they haven't had a pregnancy that, um, you know, hopefully leads to a healthy live birth yet. Uh, but for my patients, I take care of PCOS patients that have two to three periods a year, and they just don't have an equal playing field to someone else getting regular monthly release of an egg. And so they really do need help early on um, to be able to have some initial testing and to be able to um, take medicines. Uh, we most often use letrozole that has the best data for higher ovulation induction and live birth rates um, so that we can help an egg grow and um, help give a medicine to help it release a trigger shot. Um, and then we can help guide patients when to time intercourse to improve their chances. And what's really important about PCOS is that it is a very common condition amongst our reproductive age individuals and to make them really understand that it's common, they're not alone, and there's a lot that they can do to impact the outcome of their future health. So they often present to us first because of reproductive health concerns and wanting assistance in building their families. Um, but we know that PCOS actually puts you at life um, long risk of heart disease and hypertension and diabetes. And so if patients are able to make healthy lifestyle practices early on, plug in with a primary care provider and keep good continuity follow-up, keep a healthy weight, um, you know, they can mitigate that risk over the lifetime. And from our perspective, you know, in everything I do, there's a big coexistence of mental health concerns, anxiety, and depression amongst our patients. Um, and that is within the PCOS population and really supporting people um, because there can be not only the reproductive concerns, but dermatologic concerns and concerns about their future health. So it's really, you know, it's great. Some of our um, different teams throughout the country at different major academic universities will have multidisciplinary teams come together just to, to best support these patients from all these different fields. So my opinion is that, you know, if patients want to learn more, they can come talk to us as soon as they're ready and we can offer some basic counseling and, you know, they can go back to our tag team approach with their primary care provider, or they can start off their care with us and continue. We want to support in whatever way is best for the patient. Okay, great. So it sounds like you're okay with someone with PCOS with cycles every 45 days trying on their own. But if that same patient wants to see you guys right away, that's also very reasonable. That's fine because, you know, at the end of the day, after a year, they're not getting the same number of periods as someone that might be more regular. And so someone wants to come see us to talk about ways to help induce ovulation and maybe shorten the window between ovulatory events. That's reasonable. We can also talk about there's some patients that have, um, you know, they are overweight or in the obese category. And if we can talk to them about if they're able to make some lifestyle changes to reduce their weight by five to 10%, they might see that their ovulatory events happen um, in closer proximity to one another. Um, so yeah, I, I'm really guided by patients in terms of how proactive they want to be in, in terms of seeing a subspecialist. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't tell them that they can't see us off the bat if they want counseling and guidance. Okay. You mentioned letrozole, which I did read is the, the choice for ovulation induction in these patients. But I'm curious, you know, obviously we don't use that in primary care. Is there any role in metformin in improving fertility for those PCOS patients who do or don't have diabetes? It's a great question. There is some data supporting improved ovulation, but not necessarily translating to live birth. Um, so metformin, if somebody has insulin resistance in setting of PCOS, um, which is part of our workup for PCOS, it can have a role and it can be beneficial. But I wouldn't only start someone on metformin um, purely for improving their chances and not follow it up with maybe coming to see us. Okay. And then what lab testing should we start to do in primary care when we're evaluating infertility? Yeah, that's wonderful. It would be great. Um, you know, we're very happy to start from step one and order things for patients, but if you have an established relationship and they're waiting to see us and they want to really optimize their time in between, you know, your referral placement and getting a consult with us, we'd love if we could start some introductory testing. And so, um, really what I think about is I always start with a good preconception visit and talking about 
like, yeah, their thorough history taking. So their medical, surgical histories, reproductive history, any losses or, you know, any pregnancies at all, really wanting to know all those details. Um, and then in terms of testing, it's good to have a um, CBC for an anemia screen and um, a type in screen um, for um, any, you know, transfusion history or when they become pregnant to know their blood status, blood type. Um, and then uh there is some debate about checking a TSH and a hemoglobin A1C on every patient. Um, I think as a society for ASRM, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, um, we used to check TSH on all patients with infertility, but now we think we might be over-treating and that um, unless somebody's TSH is um, <clears throat> above five or they have a low free T4, maybe those are the patients that should be getting treatment. We used to really try to pretend like they were first trimester pregnant and aim for a TSH less than 2.5 as they're trying to conceive. And that's still our practice, but it might be conservative. And I think we're shifting away to such aggressive management. But um, with our patients, um, we will check a TSH, a hemoglobin A1C, and check immunities for rubella and varicella just to make sure no boosters are needed before pregnancy because those are live vaccines. We don't want to give that when someone's um, pregnant because there's a theoretical risk to the growing fetus. We want to check for immunity beforehand. Um, and then if someone needs a booster, they actually have to wait four weeks before they try to conceive. Um, in our area, we're also checking measles because there are a number of people that aren't unfortunately vaccinating for measles. Um, and we've seen a resurgence of measles cases in our area. So we also check for measles immunity. Um, so those, those are kind of, you know, and talking about things like lifestyle, talking about weight, talking about healthy practices for diet exercise earlier, we hadn't talked a lot of patients asked me about caffeine. And I think it's mean to take away caffeine from someone completely, but keeping it to about 200 milligrams is a healthy balance, um, a day. So those, those are my general counseling, but when it comes so that's kind of pre-pregnancy health, but when it comes to infertility, so, um, one test that is a marker of ovarian reserve is the AMH blood test, anti-malarian hormone. And so what that is, is it's a serum biomarker that's admitted by our granulosa cells of our pre-eggs, essentially our pre-antral and small antral follicles. And so the higher the AMH, the higher we think or larger our ovarian pool is. Um, and so it really is not meant to be like this predicts your chance to get pregnant. It just helps us when they see us, when we might be talking about medication dosing, or if they're moving to IVF, how many eggs they can anticipate to get from one cycle. Uh, so AMH is a blood test that helps with egg reserve. And when they see us, we can do a follow-up ultrasound, um, to assess egg reserve in a different way with what we call an antral follicle count. Um, so that's helpful. And then one test that you can order at Stanford, um, our radiology colleagues do are HSGs. So that stands for hysterosalpingogram. Hystero is uterus, salpingo is tube, and gram is picture. And so it's a contrast dye that is injected through the cervix. And then the radiology takes serial ultrasound picture, uh, excuse me, x-ray pictures um, that allows us to see the contrast dye fill through the uterus and the tubes and spill to confirm there's no filling defects, such as a large fiber or polyp up in the uterus or any um, blockage of the tubes to see that they're open. That one I do tell people though can be quite crampy and like severe period cramps. So I'll advise my patients to pre-medicate with ibuprofen if they're allowed to take that, if not Tylenol, um, about 30 minutes beforehand just to help reduce some of that severe cramping pain that they can feel. Um, so that's, that's kind of on the, again, this is assuming a heterosexual couple, um, the female partner side on the male partner would be a semen analysis is a great place to start. And, um, you can order that through Stanford or some of the, um, there's some actually, um, uh, at home testing that's available in terms of access if there's cost concerns as well. I assume some of our listeners might not have access to ordering a hysterosalpingogram. And I'm wondering in that case, is it ever helpful for you to have a pelvic ultrasound before you see the patient or will you still order a hysterosalpingogram anyway? Um, great question. There's a lot that can be learned and value added from a 2D ultrasound. You know, is the uterus 
normal in shape and size? Do we see that it's enlarged because of fibroids? Do we see that it's more globular in appearance, making us concerned for adenomyosis? Um, do we see the ovaries are healthy? I tell my patients the ovaries look like chocolate chip cookies um, on a transvaginal ultrasound. And we are kind of trained in our field to count the chocolate chips. Those are the antral follicles and get a sense of normal is about five to 10 per side. Um, but if people have um, cysts or something like an endometrioma. So there's a lot that can be learned on a 2D scan. I don't think that that's a requirement to do before coming to us. And part of our practice is we will do the 2D ultrasound to evaluate for the antral follicle count. And we offer a saline infusion sonogram with our team um, or an HSG. And um, the idea is that I think of the uterus like a deflated balloon. And so it's like a potential space. And we can see a lot when it's deflated, but we really do want to fill it either with saline or contrast and do uh, whether it's an ultrasound with my team or an x-ray with the radiology team to see when it fills, are there any filling defects and how does the fluid come out the tubes? Um, so those are the added benefits of the 3D with the um, fluid element. Okay. And then going back to the lab, so you mentioned um, a CBC, a blood type and screen, a possibly a TSH, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the antibodies such as measles. And um, would you routinely also recommend like a day three FSH and estradiol, a progesterone level? Those are other labs that I read about. Yeah. Great questions. Um, So yeah, we so uh, an other way to look at ovarian reserve is to do a cycle day three. Really, it can be day two, three, or four. We want an early follicular phase FSH and estradiol. Um, that is one way to assess ovarian reserve. Um, the nice thing about AMH is it can be done any time in the cycle. And um, so if people don't have regular cycles or it's hard to make that small window to have that testing, they can have the AMH. Um, but we will also do an FSH and estradiol. It's just a different way to look at what's the signaling happening between our pituitary and our ovary. So the FSH is emitted from our pituitary gland and is talking to our ovary to get an egg to grow for the month. And we'd like to know what I essentially tell my patients is that FSH doesn't have to work too hard. And so that the level is less than 10 at the early part of your cycle. If it's above 10, it might suggest the ovary is not quite responding as nicely as we'd like. And it's the brain's having to push out a little bit more FSH to get an egg to start to grow. We always check an estradiol with our FSH because we want to confirm that it's low, less than about 50 to 80 picograms per milliliter, because we want to be sure that there's not already an egg growing, making estrogen or a cyst that's making estrogen because that estrogen will suppress FSH and then the FSH will start to come down. And so we, we want to see what is FSH in a low estrogen setting? How hard is the body having to work to get an egg to grow for that month? If an egg's already growing, then that FSH isn't as reliable. It's already getting suppressed because the egg's saying, I'm growing, I don't need more FSH, negative feedback, I don't need you anymore. Um, so yeah, you can. There's some data showing AMH is you know slightly better. Our society guidelines say AMH and antral follicle count are um, solid, but I have a lot of you know colleagues that really like the FSH estradiol on top of that just to get a sense, well, are the counts normal, but there's subtle signs of ovarian aging because of this communication system we can learn a little bit more about. Uh, for progesterone, so progesterone will just tell you have you ovulated or not. So if it's above three, that tells you you've ovulated. So some of my PCOS patients that are just not sure, are, am I ovulating or just having some anovulatory spotting, you can check a progesterone level and say, you have recently ovulated and should expect your period, you know, within the next one to two weeks, depending on the level. Um, <clears throat> classically, people would check like a day 21 progesterone because that's about a week after ovulation and when progesterone will be, you know, near its highest and we can see that somebody is ovulated. Um, but that's not needed for people that are having regular periods um, they're likely ovulating. Um, so I, I don't necessarily check a progesterone and would it need someone to get that for me before they refer a patient for me to see. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like most of the time we don't need a progesterone, but maybe in someone with irregular or long periods or someone with PCOS. Yeah. Purely if you want to know how, like if you have someone who's coming to you and is like, you know, doc, I'm not sure if I'm ovulating. Then you can say, okay, let's check about a week after you think you ovulated what your progesterone level is. And if it's above three, you can say you did ovulate and that might give them some reassurance. Okay. And then, so to summarize a low FSH, good, a high AMH, 
also probably good. Yep. And then the TSH, we may or may not need to suppress that below two as someone's trying to get pregnant. Yeah. So, you know, the classically we had tried to, you know, this is a lot of the debate in the field is that there's the American Society of Reproductive Medicine and the American Thyroid Association and number of different groups that have different practices. Um, but, you know, how do we define subclinical hypothyroidism and how do we treat infertility patients? And, um, you know, do we treat people who are trying to get pregnant just like people who are in the first trimester of pregnancy? So there's a lot of heterogeneity about definitions. Um, but currently our practice, you know, we might be updating it because it might be a very conservative practice is to check a TSH in infertile patients and see, is it, you know, um, less than 2.5, we're good. If it's greater than four, then we'll treat um, with levothyroxine. If it falls between 2.5 and four, we might repeat it with an anti-TPO antibody to see if there's autoimmune activity. And then if it there is autoimmune activity, treat with um, levothyroxine to um, bring that down below 2.5 because those individuals might be at increased risk of developing autoimmune thyroid disease in the future. Um, but that that was our 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 practice and and we're now revisiting because just in December of 2023, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine said that might be overtreating. We don't actually know how we're changing live birth outcomes by doing that. And we probably don't need to treat individuals unless their TSH is above five or they have a low free T4. Um, and so we'll be shifting our practice possibly. We're having a group meeting about it in the next couple of months to decide um, will we actually stop checking for infertile patients and just check for recurrent miscarriage patients. Because we do know for recurrent miscarriage patients, um, there can be benefits in keeping the levels less than 2.5 or treating individuals who are between 2.5 and 4 with positive autoimmune markers. I see. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. That's that's really interesting to, to know that that might be shifting in your practice soon. Correct. Um, and then earlier, you also mentioned another big cause was fibroids. And that's also something we see commonly in primary care. So I'm wondering, do the location or size of the fibroids, do they help uh, you figure out if that's going to affect the fertility or not? Yeah, that's a really important um, point to focus on is where are the fibroids located? So we use the FIGO um, grading system for fibroids. And essentially, if they're submucosal or some component is within the endometrial cavity where the fetus would grow or embryo would implant, then it could have an impact on fertility. So that's type 0, 1, or 2 fibroids. Uh, <clears throat> those have some type of submucosal or endometrial component. Um, there's also a type three fibroid where it's really all within the muscle, but really maybe is touching the cavity. Um, and so those are more questionable, the impact they have on fertility. Ones that are purely within the muscle or within the skin, so the um, intramural or the subserosals, those don't necessarily impact fertility. But really when I approach fibroids, I think like our patients symptomatic. So regardless of where they are or how big they are, if they are having heavy, painful menstrual bleeding, you know, that might warrant getting treatment ahead of time of getting pregnant. Um, and interestingly, our medical treatments are often hormones that prevent pregnancy. So it might be a birth control pill or an IUD or Depo-Lupron. And so those are taking away some time from people who want to try to get pregnant. So some patients wanting to try to get pregnant sooner might opt for surgical management. Um, and we have a wonderful fibroid center at Stanford. I have to give a huge shout out to them. And um, they are so happy to take referrals. And often if patients have large or multiple fibroids, they'll get an MRI ahead of time to really be able to counsel patients on their treatment options. Um, because it's not just surgery. There are some um, minimally invasive techniques with um, high intensity focused ultrasound um, treatments, um, transcervical ablation technology. So really fibroid management has... Um, evolved beautifully. So there's options for patients. But in terms of the fertility component, it's really, if a patient is asymptomatic and has a fibroid, we can just watch it. Unless it's within the uterine cavity, then we might want to recommend that we can do a hysteroscopic resection of the submucosal component um, or talk about laparoscopic or abdominal um, surgeries for others if they have a large fibroid burden or a large fibroid that while they're pregnant might grow and cause some pain. They want to deal with it ahead of time. So 
there's some more gray categories that we can talk about. Um, but truly, if you're just like, will my fibroid impact my fertility? Um, questionable on anything, not directly in the cavity, in the cavity, good to address. And so you mentioned endometriosis is another cause of infertility. And I've read that 25 to 50% of infertility is attributable to endometriosis. And the other problem is the condition is often underdiagnosed. Um, any guidance on which endometriosis patients we should send sooner to your clinic? Yes, and that's absolutely right. So there is a high incidence of endometriosis and infertility, especially in patients that are also having symptoms of endometriosis, such as painful periods or pain with intercourse or pain with bowel movements. Um, in terms of who to send to our clinic, we are happy to see any patients that have fertility concerns and endometriosis, just to kind of talk more about how endometriosis can impact fertility, whether it's actual physical like adhesive disease or this inflammatory state that might be negative towards implantation or gamete quality. Um, so we're very, very happy to counsel anyone. I think individuals that have mild disease, so that can be stage one or two disease, <clears throat> there's less thought that treating purely for fertility is helpful. And we have some data that um, those individuals, if you were to try to take them to laparoscopy and treat them surgically, um, you know, you'd probably, if they have infertility and known endometriosis, need to take 11 to 12 people to surgery to get one additional pregnancy. If someone's just unexplained and you don't know if they have endometriosis, but you're suspicious and want to take them, it's probably number needed to treat 40 to get one additional live birth. So we've decided purely for fertility purposes, you know, we don't need to necessarily treat those patients surgically. Um, you know, any patient coming with endometriosis, we want to talk about, you know, less conservative to more aggressive interventions. So NSAIDs, hormonal suppression and surgery, often hormonal suppression are forms of contraception. So they can't be used for people trying to get pregnant. So then we end up talking about surgery. Um, for more aggressive disease or, you know, stage three, four disease, there is a role for surgery, but we also have to talk about the risks of surgery, the recovery from surgery. And if that endometriosis is involving their ovaries, it could be that in removing the endometriosis, we're actually causing damage to the ovarian follicular pool. And so then even though we've treated the endometriosis, now they have lower egg counts. So it's a conversation to be had that many of my patients might decide I have bad symptoms, so I want to go for surgery um, and I accept the risks. Or they might say, I you know, don't really have bad symptoms, they're manageable, or this was an incidental finding, so I'll just focus on um, going to IUI or going to IVF more directly um, and then uh, not going to surgery unless maybe initial treatments have failed and they want to consider it as a backup. Um, yeah, but I really am guided for endometriosis on treatment based on patient symptoms. So if they're very symptomatic, then we want to think about any treatment that might be warranted and help them. Um, but purely for fertility, it's more of a conversation. Uh, one example is, you know, if someone has a very large endometrioma and I can't access their ovary safely, even if I were to stimulate with IVF, then I'd want to take out that endometrioma. But if access isn't an issue and they're not very symptomatic, we can just talk about doing fertility treatments and not necessarily doing a separate surgery just for endometriosis. I see. Okay. And then you've mentioned I, IUI and IVF. And I'm curious, so which patients would you consider trying IUI before IVF? Oh, yes. Okay. So that's a great question. <clears throat> and I will try to categorize it. So if somebody has um, unexplained infertility, our standard treatment is to recommend a stepwise approach, which is starting with um, super ovulation using Clomid or Letrozole and um, IUI, intrauterine insemination. And we'll try that about three to four cycles. And if someone's not pregnant, we'll escalate to IVF. But it's a very um, a dynamic and layered conversation because when I meet with a couple, I'll also try to understand what are their family building goals? So if I see a 37 year old and they tell me they want three children and we start with IUI and hopefully it's successful, but then they come back at age 39 or 40 for their second child, they might be further in that reproductive window and facing more impact from ovarian aging. So that individual, I might talk to them about the benefits of doing IVF up front because they can do one or more cycles to make embryos for all the children that they desire so that they can use them one by one to get pregnant for the first baby and then have some saved for subsequent children that they want. 
Um, but <clears throat> So IUI, we can start with people with unexplained infertility or mild male factor infertility. So sperm counts are mildly low and we'll get a boost from intrauterine insemination. If some patients that have vaginismus um, and they're not able to have intercourse, but they can do a pelvic exam or speculum exam. So we want them to work with pelvic floor physical therapy and this amazing behavioral team we have at Stanford that does a multidisciplinary approach to vaginismus um, to focus on, you know, their sexual wellness, but they also might want to move forward with IUI to help get pregnant sooner. And so um, <clears throat> those individuals, we um, can help with IUI if they can tolerate the speculum exam. Um, and some individuals with erectile dysfunction maybe struggle with intercourse, but are able to provide sperm in a cup. And so we're able to help with um, intrauterine insemination for those individuals. Um, for my PCOS patients, they often will start with timed intercourse because really the issue is ovulation. But if they've tried three to six cycles of timed intercourse and that's not led to pregnancy, we might escalate to intrauterine inseminations. Um, so often we can start with intrauterine insemination as maybe a lower cost, less invasive approach to fertility treatments. Um, but then if, for instance, someone's tubes are blocked, then we can't do IUI. So we'll go to IVF. Um, or if someone has very low counts of sperm, then we'll need to um, do IVF. Or if someone's trying to, as I mentioned, um, make embryos for the future, we'll do IVF. So IVF does have a higher success rate, but it is um, very doable, but relative to IUI, um, more time and more money, uh, more involvement. And so um, some people go straight there, but some people do a stepwise approach and start with IUIs. I see. So it sounds like a really individualized decision depending Correct. on age, how many kids they want, what factors might be contributing to the infertility issue. Absolutely. That's a great <laughs> story. And then can you describe the different stages and procedures that patients are going through when they're receiving IVF? Oh, yes. Well, just to take even a step back, when they first meet with us, we'll have a new patient consultation, we'll review any, you know, records they have to date, and we'll take a new thorough history and do a schedule for a physical and to do our ultrasound and to do our lab testing and to do the HSG or saline infusion sonogram and the semen analysis. Um, and then we'll have a follow-up visit. We'll go over all the results and we'll figure out, okay, what's our plan? IUI, IVF, timed intercourse, you know, with ovulation help for PCOS patients. Um, if people have recurrent miscarriage, you know, we can talk about, is there an identifiable reason there? Can we offer support? Um, so that's kind of the approach. But once we've decided to answer your question about the process of IVF in particular, um, the process, um, we, it's, um, step by step. So we have um, a wonderful nursing team. And so they will help to kind of orient our patients. So they have a class where patients will learn a little bit more about their specific protocol that their physician has chosen. Um, and they learn how to administer the medicines to themselves because they are subcutaneous lower abdominal injections that are given. Um, and then the patients will receive a calendar. They'll get help from a fertility pharmacy to get their medicines delivered. Um, and they'll have a baseline ultrasound to check the ovaries are healthy before proceeding with the injections, just to make sure there's no cysts or problems where it's not a good cycle to proceed. So once you've been cleared, um, you proceed into the injection course, which is on average about nine to 12 days of injections. And that can be a busy time. During that time, patients are coming every few days for an ultrasound to just see how is it going? Do we need to adjust the medicines? Do we need to get a lab draw? Um, how are patients feeling? So um, probably in the nine to 12 days of injections, we have about four to six ultrasounds. And then when we decide the egg cohort for that month has grown as optimally as possible, we will say, okay, you can stop the injections. Typically, depending on the protocol, they're about three to four injections a day. Um, so they can stop those injections and then take a special set of trigger injections, which um, mature the eggs and get them ready to release. But before they ovulate, we schedule our egg retrieval about 36 hours, 35, 36 hours later. And so that day, patients will need to take the day off because they'll have anesthesia and they will be asleep. At Stanford, we make sure, you know, pain control is really important. And so people are asleep and they have no memory or feeling during the procedure. And so then they we will retrieve the um, eggs. And so the ovaries have grown bigger with multiple eggs growing and they sit right on top of the vaginal um Apex, and so we're able to enter a transvaginal probe and gently advance a very thin 17 gauge needle through the top of the vagina right into the ovary and drain the follicular fluid we've been measuring on ultrasound. 
that's collected in test tubes and sent to our embryologist sitting right next to us and they start identifying the eggs. Then if someone's doing egg freezing, we, you know, we haven't talked as much about fertility preservation today, but I have a lot of people wanting to save options for the future to build their family. So we can just freeze the eggs or fertilize and freeze the embryos or for, you know, soon use, if you're looking to get pregnant right now and facing infertility or future use, if you're, you know, needing them in the future, if you face infertility. Um, but that's pretty much, you know, the overview, depending on the protocol, some people will, um, use birth control pills or use estrogen pills, um, uh, to lead up in terms to help with scheduling and priming the ovaries, um, before they move into the injection period. And then just on the individualized protocol that, you know, their physician chooses is optimal for them. It sounds like there's a number of different protocols, but they generally involve a lot of injections, <laughs> labs, and a number of ultrasounds. Yeah. Uh, and do you, you know, I've had patients who say, oh, wow, I did not know I'd be injecting myself three times or that the egg retrieval was going to be this painful. Mm -hmm. Is there something you wish primary care providers told patients to kind of prepare them of what's to come before they saw you guys for possible IVF? That is a great um, question. So I think we recognize when people come to see us, they were ready to have their family over six to 12 months before. And mm -hmm. it's hard to realize that they're embarking on like another chapter in this journey. And I think it's a big step to come to IVF. And then really people are hopeful, like one and done, but it's it's actually very common that people have to try more than one time. And so I think preparing people that they're not alone. We didn't actually get to talk at the, the beginning that infertility probably affects one in six couples. Um, or if, you know, I take a hundred couples, probably at the end of a year, 12 to 15% will be facing infertility. So it's very common and people are not alone. Um, and that there's so much more awareness today than there was, you know, before and better discussion and openness and vulnerability and sharing that this is a common, um, challenge that people face. And so I think just letting people know they're not alone and there might be a journey of treatment ahead of them. And some people goes faster and some people goes longer, um, for, for each person. Um, there's some good resources and patient advocacy and support groups. So people can kind of learn about the process. Cause that's what I hear is a really big stressor from, from my patients is just the unknown of what they're embarking on, um, and the loneliness of it. And fertility is such a sensitive and personal topic. Uh, and some people feel less ready to share with their family members or friends. Um, and so, and then the mental health component we talked about. So I, I think, um, you know, letting them know in, in regard to your specific question, they're not alone to be afraid of injections and that they'll do great. The majority of people do great. And for people who are really scared, there's companies that they can hire to help with the injections at home, but most are able to take the class and first few days are a little scary, but then they get into a good, good rhythm and they do great. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to just emphasize what you mentioned about it really being a challenge, people feeling alone, just kind of the emotional turmoil that, um, the person or couple faces. And I'm just wondering how else we can support them as their primary care providers as they go through this. Are there any um, support groups that you recommend, for example, that we could let them know about? Yeah, that's so nice. I think, again, emphasizing they're not alone and having the you know compassion that we, our wonderful primary care team does um, is huge. Uh, we have a patient advocacy group called Resolve, and they have a lot of very good resources on their website and um, guiding people to trustworthy sources like that to, to find support is great. And um, there's a lot on social media. I think you have to be careful, you know, what is evidence-based and, you know, what is people sharing their experiences, which is amazing and empowering, but maybe not everyone's experience. So we want to kind of, you know, remove the unknown, but also not induce fear. So um but yeah, I think Resolve is a great um, resource that people can uh, try to learn more about our process and then asking us when they get to see us because we might have more. And and really, I encourage mental health counseling. Um, I think that there are some clinics actually within the U.S that require it for all their patients going through with an infertility or miscarriage history because they just know the prevalence um, of having mental health diseases as a comorbidity with infertility or recurrent miscarriage. So we are blessed that we have a reproductive mental health counselor at our clinic and we offer that to everyone as they come in on intake just to say additional support can be really helpful. 
Yeah. Okay. That's great. I will definitely make note of resolve. Um, I'm sure I'll be using that soon. And um, you mentioned women having to go through multiple cycles of IVF. And I'm curious, how is there a time period that people have to wait in between cycles? Um, does the chance of getting pregnant increase or decrease with each additional cycle? Yeah, great question. So the <clears throat> generally we recommend a rest cycle in between just to give your body a break and a chance to recoup and to see how the previous cycle went. Cause if we're waiting on um, the embryo report or if people have done genetic testing of the embryos, they might want to see like, how was that outcome? What changes should we make for the next cycle? So we typically recommend one month or one cycle or rest cycle between cycles. Um, I will say though, if people have extenuating circumstances, like we take care of patients who are trying to freeze eggs or embryos before cancer treatment, and we have to do back-to-back -back cycles or there's, you know, very special protocols like duostim protocols you can stimulate in the follicular and luteal phase for a patient if it's a really tight window. So you can do it closer to one another if needed. Um, it's just those are more time-sensitive situations. Um, in terms of success, so, you know, we have good data that the more cycles you're able to do, the more your cumulative chance of success is. Um, so, you know, that question is interesting to answer because somebody maybe who's young and has a high count of eggs and was able to get what they need in one go and they're done versus someone that's older and has a lower count of eggs might need multiple cycles because just each chance of IVF is 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 lower. You know, that's a hard thing about IVF is a lot of people think it, think it just fixes everything, but it really, its success is dependent on, you know, the age and the ovarian counts within which it's being used. So if somebody is older, they might have to prepare that they need to do multiple cycles to increase their um, chance of success. Um, and there's, there's data supporting that the cumulative chances can come up when you're able to try more cycles. Hmm. But it's and not that, you know, some people will tell me like your, your third cycle is going to be better than your second cycle because the medicine's in your body or you're more used to it or something like that. I have some patients bring that up to me that they've heard or read online. Like, should I take a break? Should I not take a break? And, you know, we don't have robust data guiding us in that way. Yeah. And is there a certain point where you recommend stopping and not doing an additional IVF cycle? Yeah, those are the toughest conversations. So, you know, there are very poor prognosis patients where we think their chance of success is less than 5%. And then there's a concern for futile care where the chance is less than 1% of success. Um, at Stanford, um, you know, we are different from private practices that, you know, some with respect say, if your chance is thought to be less than 5%, we're not going to let you proceed because it's money you're spending. And, you know, we don't want you to undergo care that might not be successful. For us at Stanford, um, we have pretty liberal age limits that people can try within um, because we want, we're a major academic center. We can take care of more medically complex patients in um, we want people to be able to understand that um, sometimes there's some therapeutic benefit of trying. And even if it wasn't successful, they've tried at least once and 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 they won't have that thought in their mind. What if I had tried? Um, but we have to be very honest, which is the hardest thing, which is to say, you know, we can try and we can give the medicines, but we can't overcome the age impact. And so we might not see the outcomes that we want. And so we risk having a cycle where there's no embryo to be able to use. Um, and there are some people where we think that that's very likely going to be the case again. And so we'll recommend probably moving from trying with your own eggs to trying with donor eggs because we know donor eggs are younger and better quality. And so people stand a higher chance, but we respect that's a very personal decision that not everyone might feel comfortable with. So they might pivot to other family building, like adopting or fostering or co-parenting. Um, so yeah, there, there are instances where it's, it's hard. It's the hardest part of the job, but important for us to medically guide people um, when it's good to keep trying versus to pause and think of alternative treatment options. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds tough. Um, and we've been talking largely about women who wanted to get pregnant today or yesterday. Um, yes. But frequently I see women who are in their thirties. And when they ask, when I ask them if they want to have children, they say, yes, but not now. And how do you recommend that I talk to them about the age-related decline in fertility and possible options like egg or embryo freezing when they aren't necessarily inviting that conversation? That is a really tough, um, yeah, situation to be in and navigate. But I think that normalizing it and even making it like 
part of your intake or part of your questionnaire, or you do this for every young 30 year old is that you just say one of my, you know, health maintenance questions for today is to talk about family building. And you can tell me if this is something on your mind or something you're open to hearing more about or not. And if they say, nope, I don't want to talk about it. You can respect that. But most people I imagine would say, sure, I'm happy to hear the basic spiel. And, um, you know, typically I just want to understand, you know, do people want to have a family where, you know, there's many ways to build a family, as you said, but would they like to have genetically related children? And um, what is their anticipated timeline? You know, do they want to do it within a partnership? Would they like to have multiple children? And so when you might hear of someone who says, yeah, I'd like to have three kids. And I think after age 35, you know, that is uh, an area to raise, you know, where we can start talking about, the ovarian aging process, the reproductive window, higher rates of infertility and miscarriage as we get older. And so the benefits of egg or embryo freezing. Um, and, you know, a lot of people come to me and they say, I want to test my fertility so I can understand, do I need to freeze eggs or embryos? And there's no test for fertility except for actually trying to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And we can get a snapshot in time with someone's AMH and their antral follicle count, but we don't know how that will decline. I generally said there's an early decline, a, a slight decline in the early thirties and a more notable decline in the later thirties, early forties, but those are averages. So some people are going to be earlier. Some people will be later. We can't know. So really our society guidelines say we shouldn't use those values to tell people like yours are normal. You're fine. You can wait to have kids. We shouldn't be saying that. We should just be saying like, what is, you know, taking their full social history? Like what is your situation, which you'd like to build your family and what's your timeline? And if it seems they want a larger family and they're going to wait some time to do that, then they're a good candidate for egg or embryo freezing. But if I have a 32 year old who's married and wants to start trying in a year and only wants one child, they're probably fine. They can try in a year. And if they face difficulty after a year of trying, come see a fertility specialist. But if you have that same 32 year old who's like, I'm a resident here at Stanford and I have seven years ahead of me till I'm ready to have a kid and I'd like to have three kids and they're an excellent candidate. Um, and then the egg versus embryo conversation is an important one. Um, so eggs, if people are single, <clears throat> makes sense. I think it's obvious, but we can't undo the sperm and egg. So um, it used to be that embryos just had more history of the freezing and thawing process. So people would say, always go for embryos if you can, or if you'd consider donor sperm, make an embryo. But now with our new vitrification, how we're able to freeze and thaw, the success rates are, are very good for both. And so People can consider eggs <clears throat> when they're single, not ready to commit the eggs to sperm. Um, it's less expensive. So people can find that that's helpful. Um, some people feel uncomfortable creating embryos. Um, they prefer to have eggs just personally or ethically or religiously speaking. Um, in our new political landscape with, you know, certain states um, assigning personhood to embryos, people feel uncomfortable about what that can mean for their future disposition of their embryos. So they are opting to do eggs. Um, we're really blessed in California that that's not our case, but as we saw in Alabama, you know, that was a reality they were facing. So, um, you know, for embryos, we can, you know, if you're sure of the sperm situation as, as best as you can be, and you're able to, um, it's relatively more expensive because you're actually going to fertilize them, grow them to embryo, possibly biopsy them for genetic testing options. That just involves, you know, more on the embryology labs part. So there's more cost associated with that, but you also can see how the eggs play out better. How do they actually fertilize and actually make it to the embryo stage called the blastocyst. And so if you do better or worse than average, you might know earlier on, do I need less or more cycles than I thought I did? Um, and and yeah, so I, I think that there's benefits, pros and cons to both approaches, and they're both very good. And we can have that conversation at our at our visit. Um, but that that's how I would go about introducing it with people, just normalizing that, you know, we have a lot of a lot of survey data that there is a lot of misinformation about the decline in fertility with age and that people wish they knew or people wish that their physician had brought it up to them. Um, so I think framing it from that angle, um, I think you'd mostly get happy people versus upset people. Yeah. Yeah. No, those are all great ways to bring up the conversation and expand upon them. And you're right. I think a lot of people don't really know about these options until it might be a little bit um, too late. 
And um, lastly, to wrap up, I wanted to ask you, are there any advancements on the horizon of infertility diagnosis or treatment that you're particularly excited about? Okay. Thank you for that question. It is hard to choose. Um, there's a lot on the horizon. I think a big area in our field is, is really access um, in terms of how can we have um, lower costs and more providers for individuals um, so that we can meet the need of the 12 to 15% of couples out there facing infertility. Um, and so there is a lot in that space of um, whether it could be, how can you get your ultrasounds done at home? And then the images get uploaded and the doctors can review it. And so you don't have to miss as much work or have that time commuting to and from the clinic. That would be great for the future, um, just to reduce the logistical burdens that we're very sensitive that our patients face. Um, there's great work being happening for, um, you know, our cancer patients or our patients that don't have time to undergo treatment where we're just able to get um, immature eggs. And so do we have the chance to um, mature the eggs in the future um, after they've been thawed um, versus having to wait to undergo stimulation and maturation and then only be able to use the eggs. Um, and then there's really fascinating work about people being able to um, you know, use stem cells to create gametes to then be able to have reproductive potential. And so that could be really helpful for people that maybe have severe diminished ovarian reserve and don't have usable eggs themselves to still have genetically related children or same-sex couples so that they can maybe both contribute gamete potential if we're able to make gametes from stem cells. So there's amazing work on the horizon and it's hard to choose just one. It must be so exciting to work in such a rapidly changing field. Yes, it is so true. We're relatively young. I think, you know, our first IVF baby was 78. So this mm -hmm. is we're a young field and things have grown incredibly. And, you know, we didn't even get to talk much today about the genetics, but some of the reasons I have people come to see me, which I think actually is really important to highlight for the primary care population is if you have someone who has Lynch syndrome or the BRCA mutation, those are um, monogenic disorders that can be identified within the um, embryos. And so we can do genetic testing of the embryos and understand which embryos inherited the mutated genes and which didn't and work to only put back unaffected embryos. And so while we can't cure these diseases, we can bypass them being inherited by the next generation. And so that's been a huge focus is just the genetics potential of what we're doing right now. Um, or some of the preconception counseling I didn't mention earlier was um, we can do carrier screening, right, to make sure people aren't matches for common ones or CF or spinal muscular atrophy or thalassemias, hearing loss. Um, so if people are a match, you know, you could, one, let them know they're at risk, but they also could opt to screen the embryos to see which received two autosomal recessive mutated copies, and then they could, you know, be sick and we can avoid that. Um but we're also very understanding, you know, I'm very guided by the patients. We're not, you know, some have endured these conditions and that's, you know, shaped them into who they are. And we're not trying to like weed that out if people don't want to. It's just, we have patients come to us and say, this was really negatively impactful on my life. I'd like to avoid that for my child. And then um, we're really grateful to help in that way. So yeah, we're, it's exciting. It's booming. And um, yeah, I love what I do. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing what you guys accomplish in your field. I'm constantly surprised by some of the patients that I that come back from you guys. Um, and so just thank you so much for talking with me today. And this has been such a helpful overview on how I can think about and start to assess infertility before I send them over to you. Oh, you're so welcome. I really appreciate you initiating this conversation just for better understanding bidirectionally and how we can best support our patients. And um, it's, yeah, it's wonderful to help them in this way. And I hope today was informative. Thank you.